Hello, this is David Mandel once again, and welcome to week four of CIS 240L Linux Systems Administration uh, given in the summer of 2012. Um, for this week, what we want to talk about is um, mostly we're going to be doing chapter seven in the textbook on um, uh, Bash Shell bash shell and bash shell scripting. And <clears throat> in any case, first thing I want to mention is, of course, Caligator. We always start with Caligator.org every week. Let's take a little look at what's happening this week with Caligator. First thing happening is, um, shrink that. First thing happening is OSCON, which we'll get back to. And then there are a lot of other events here. Um, PDI, Packathon, um, uh, here's a workshop, here's a, a ja Portland Java Users Group, um, Ruby Beginners uh, Meetup, and um, Apache Shindig, so on and so forth. However, the big thing happening this week in Portland is OSCON. Last week, we had um, or last weekend, we had the uh, Community Leadership Conference, which was in Portland at the um, Oregon Convention Center over the weekend. I was there along with maybe 150, 200 other people, um, many of which have prominent roles in the open source community. Um, and it was fun. It was interesting. It was fun. Um, this week, there is OSCON in Portland. The exhibits and the boffs for OSCON are either cheap or free. I keep getting little things in my email on how to get in free. I think you can get in free. If worse comes to worse, you have to pay $25. That only gets you into the exhibits, but um, just getting into the exhibits is really an enlightening experience. Um, and it's really worthwhile. I really do advocate uh, trying to drop by OSCON for a little bit, if you can. Of course, if you work or whatnot, that's likely not possible. The exhibits are given on Wednesday and Thursday um, at about an hour Tuesday in the evening, I guess. But, but really, Wednesday and Thursday are the day, big days for the exhibits. There's usually a party sometime, and it's pretty easy to get free tickets to the parties. If you just go around to the exhibits, somebody often gives you a free ticket. Um, and there's usually a free party. Um, um, and that's fun to go to. <laughs> and usually on Wednesday night, I guess, maybe sometimes both Wednesday and Thursday nights. It, it really depends, because somebody has to sponsor the thing. Um, OK. Other things going on is uh, Quiz 2 is now closed. Talk to me if you didn't take Quiz 2 or didn't take Quiz 1. Um, we should be up through Labs 6 now. And I'm, I haven't been grading the labs really quickly because I haven't wanted to give late penalties. And I never give a late penalty if I haven't, graded, uh, if I haven't done my first cut grading of the labs. So, but I'd like to get on with grading, and um, and I notice labs are coming in a little bit slow. Um, let's, I mean, that's not too bad, but let's let's start getting our labs in on time, or well, on time, or close to being on time. Uh, we really ought to be getting labs four and five. Really should be in by now. Um, We'll be doing Lab 7 this week, which is number two of three different shell scripts that we have to do uh, for the course. The other thing before ending the discussion for the week and going on, I just want to say a word about um, the topic of why large computer system projects fail. It seems to me like we're always reading in the news about this multi-billion dollar, or multi-million dollar usually, multi-million dollar computer project that failed. 
Uh, most recently, I think I've been reading about the Oregon State Radio Project, which is supposed to connect um, um, emergency responders across the state. And well, the, a lot of money has been spent. Not much has happened. Um, it seems to be a failure. A while back, what was it? Um, the, uh, the, the Department of Motor Vehicles in Oregon had a major disaster. They lost. They they wasted millions of dollars of, of taxpayer money trying to build a computer system that apparently couldn't be built, not within the specs they wanted. Um, and all they were doing, really, is trying to build what um, Arizona and several other states had tried to build and failed at in the past. So um, Oregon didn't learn from other states' mistakes. Um, recently, I read that the National Archives had a huge computerization system that is not working. Um, um, of course, we're, most of us are familiar with MetroFi in the Portland area, where there was going to be this um, free wireless network across Portland that was going to do everything for us for free. And um, there was some wisdom in that, because very little taxpayer money was spent on that. So I, I will defend um, the planners that were involved in the government. Still, it was a big disaster. They promised a lot and delivered little, if anything. Um, meanwhile, projects like Personal Telco, Personal Telco at personaltelco.org, uh, which is a totally volunteer group, which has promised much less, <laughs> has surprisingly delivered more than Metrofy ever did deliver, um, while promising nothing. Um, some irony in that. Um, I was involved with, uh, or I was working with BLM when they did a project called a BLM Modernization. Uh, it never really worked very well. OK, so a lot of big computer projects fail. And I've always asked myself why. And over the years, what I, in my opinion, what happens is never do a big project. Um, that is the lesson. Instead, do continuous little projects. Uh, when you change through evolution as opposed to revolution, the results are generally a lot more successful. So instead of setting these hard and fast standards for computer type things where everything will be just like this because we've got it down just the way everything should work, one is better. Um, loosening one standards and allowing, you know, we've got some old machines, we've got some newer machines. They don't talk to one another too well, so we got to bailing wire stuff together and kind of make things talk to one another. And then another generation comes in, and we kind of have to add those to the system. Well, the result is is the people involved in this learn how to do that, and um, it becomes old hat for them. Yes, it's a bit painful. It's a bit hard. But they just learn how to deal with all of this stuff. Whereas in a revolutionary change, you know, you have a system that kind of works. Yes, it's 20 years old, and you can't buy those vacuum tubes anymore. But it kind of works. And then you're going to come up with the, the, the great new replacement system. Normally, that means that you, ha because it's so expensive, you have to spend so much time designing it and getting it perfect, because you can't afford failure. So you spend so much time designing it that that, you know, you spend five years designing it. That means you've already designed a system that's five years out of date, because it took you that long to design it. And, um, and then when it comes, nobody's trained, nobody's ready, nobody's prepared for it. Um, the salespeople that sold the system to you probably overpromised, promised more than their engineers said they could actually do. And, um, and everybody's expecting a marvelous solution, and you get junk. Um, so all I'm saying is, when you know systems administrators often have to recommend um, changes and upgrades for systems, and 
the lesson I've learned over the years is um, evolution is better than revolution. Thank you. Bye-bye.